Thank you. That's it. You turn it off now. Yeah. Should I turn it off? Yeah, turn it off. Everybody back? But um, maybe another um, definition might be if it's quantum and they're talking about Alice and Bob, you can be fairly certain they're doing quantum information theory. Okay. Um, philosophical issues asso associated with quantum mechanics. Let me just say, first of all, what if I think of a philosophical issue is and the dif difference between philosophical questions and questions of pure physics. It doesn't have to do with your job title or what's um, on your office door. I think you got from Nick's talk that a lot of philosophical questions traditionally have been raised by and dealt with by people we consider physics, physicists. Um, so the basic idea is that um, the practice of doing science or practice of doing physics more specifically gives rise to questions whose answer isn't part of norm, doing normal physics. So when you're um, trying to construct a theory of some phenomena, or you're doing experiments, or you're doing calculations within a theory, we all recognize that as physics. But when you're stepping back and saying, well, what the heck is this theory telling us about the world, or what do the concepts of this theory mean, or what counts as good evidence for a theory, that sort of thing, 
you're doing what we now recognize as philosophy of science or philosophy of physics. Traditionally, it's been done by, um, by the same people who are doing the science scientists. So for example, if you read Newton's Principia, he, call, he calls everything he's doing natural philosophy. But we can recognize, you know, with our, our categorizations, we can recognize parts of what he's doing is formulating a physical theory and deriving predictions from it. And then, you know, there's this scolium on space and time where he steps back and says, well, what do these concepts that we use to formulate the laws of motion mean? And that belongs to what we would now call philosophy of physics. So, there have been philosophical issues connected with quantum mechanics from the very beginning. If you go back and look, read the transcripts of the discussions at, for example, the um, Fifth Solvay Conference in 1927, they're, 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 they're philosophical questions. They're asking what this theory is telling us about the world. Um, and those sorts of questions, the traditional questions, philosophical questions about quantum mechanics, um, things like the measurement problem, which is a bit mi um, um, misnamed a little bit, it really has to do with the fact that um, in all kinds of situations and not only measurement situations, if you think you can treat all kinds of systems quantum mechanically, then ordinary Schrodinger evolution leads to superpositions of macroscopically distinct states, and you have to ask, well, what, is, what does that mean? How are we supposed to... Um, take that. Um, what is a quantum state? Is it, or does it represent something physical? Does it represent information about the system that somebody might have? Um, those, two, those two questions were there from the very beginning in the 1920s. Um, uh, um, after Bell's theorem um, was formulated, and, and um, in particular in the, in the wake of experimental tests of Bell inequalities, there's a lot of discussion about the implications of violations of Bell inequalities for understanding. Those are all things I, I'm counting as the traditional sorts of questions, philosophical questions concerning quantum mechanics. Um, there's a vast literature on that. Um, I find that not all, all physicists are always familiar with the philosophical literature, so if you're interested, um, I can recommend as a resource for that this um, issue, I'm sorry, this um, article in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I'm recommending it not, not merely because I wrote it, but because I think it's, it's meant to be a, a useful, um, it's meant to be a useful introduction to the issues and it's full of pointers to the literature, including pointers to other, other um, articles in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Okay, so those are the traditional issues. Since the rise of quantum information theory, there have been people saying, well, this gives us a new perspective, and this gives rise to new philosophical questions. And so here's a quote from Jeff Boob, who was one of the philosophers to first explicitly say this way back in the year 2000. Recent work on quantum information over the past 10 years has led to a shift of focus in which the puzzling features of quantum mechanics are seen as a resource to be developed rather than a problem to be solved. Okay, so as I mentioned, since that time, there has been a vast literature on, on the philosophy of quantum information theory. I cannot canvas it all. So I'm gonna just give you a little sampling of a few topics. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some um, issues associated with quantum computing. I'm going to talk about information theoretic reconstructions of quantum theory, and then some more speculative things um, people have said about the relationship between information and reality. Okay. All right, quantum computing. Um, quantum computer could, in principle, maybe, be constructed that could accomplish certain tasks more efficiently than is believed a classical computer could. Okay. Famous example, Shor's algorithm for, for um, finding prime factors of a large number. Okay. And this um, increase in efficiency is called in the literature quantum speed up. K 
characteristic of problems for which there is a quantum advantage over classical computers is they involve answers that are easily verifiable as correct once you have them, but hard to find. Um, factoring large numbers is um, like that. So if, for example, I give you this huge number and I tell you it's the product of two prime factors, what are you going to do? You're going to start testing primes until you find um, one that actually factorizes it. But once you've got that, multiplication is easy. And you say, you know what? I didn't know it before, but I really didn't have to test all those other numbers. I guess, if, you know, I just needed to test this one. So a lot of the computation you did was not directly um, uh, need, needed for the answer to your problem. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's what I just said. Okay. Right. So, Shor's algorithm, if you look, and many other uh, quantum algorithms, involve preparing a computer in a superposition of states corresponding to classical computational states. And this has suggested to some people that what the quantum computer is doing is doing lots and lots of um, calculations in parallel. And if you start thinking like that, and if you've heard of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, there's a ten, there's, um, you're led to think, okay, maybe that's how we should think of um, quantum computation as a sort of many worlds thing, that actually what's going on is we're harnessing the um, power of the um, many worlds um, multiverse, and we're managing to do parallel computations in different worlds. And in fact, that is what um, the founder of quantum computing, David Deutsch, um, said, the guy who first um, had the idea that something like this is possible. So, he's, so he issues a challenge. He said, you know what? You don't believe in many worlds. If you're one of those poor souls who still think there's just one universe, explain how Shor's algorithm works. Not everyone accepts that. So here's a counterpoint from Andrew Steen, saying um, we should understand a gain in computational efficiency as a given result achieved with less processing, not as a given result achieved with the same amount of processing in parallel. So I mentioned that actually um, a classical computer um, doing a problem like that is, in a sense, doing more calculation than is necessary. So Steen's perspective is um, we should actually think of quantum computers as doing less computation than the corresponding classical one, not more. So who's right about this? How should we understand quantum speed up? That's a philosophical issue. They don't disagree on any of the details um, of the mathematics. Um, if they, um, you know, they don't, you know, if one of them disagreed about the possibility of implementing a quantum um, com uh, um, computer, that would be a matter of physics, not of philosophy. But this question of trying to understand um, the reason for quantum speed up is a philosophical question. Um, there are, um, so that's one philosophical issue associated with quantum information. Um, there are a number of others, so let me just point you to another Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy um, article on quantum computing. But better yet, you know, there's a guy who knows about the, in this room, who knows a lot more than I do about these things. So if you're interested in hearing more about the philosophy of quantum computing, just you know, buttonhole um, Mike Kafara there. Okay. By the way, um, I encourage people to um, ask questions as I go. So if anything I say isn't clear, just raise your hand. Another interesting development is information theoretic reconstructions of quantum mechanics. Um, and the idea is that you want to recover the structure of quantum mechanics on the basis of hopefully a small number of information theoretical principles. And this usually takes place within the framework of general probabilistic theories, which you know, um, Flaminia introduced you to. The framework, it's a framework for discussing wide classes of theories with, with it, without um, 
any particular commitment to what's going on at the physical level because it's couched in operational terms and um, you know in this um, generalized framework all you need is uh, is probabilistic relations between preparation procedures and um, and out outcomes of experiments possibly modified by um, transformations of the state um, so the idea is you've got the class of all possible general general probabilistic theories and some of those input-output probability relations will be the sorts of things that can be recovered by classical mechanics. Some of them will be the sorts of things that can't be recovered by classical mechanics, but can be recovered by um, quantum mechanics. And then some, you know, it's a broad framework. It'll include all kinds of probabilistic relations that are not um, realized in any physical theory that anybody has so far um, formulated. So the idea is, um, Take the general framework and list some principles that's going to have the result that the um, probability relations can be um, re uh, um, realized um, in a Hilbert space representation with non commuting observables. And that's pretty much quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, so there's, at this point, a vast literature on this. Um, I'm not going to even attempt to do justice on it, to justice, justice to it, but I just want to talk about a couple broad approaches. One thing that's occurred to people is that perhaps we can um, characterize the um, range of possible correl quantum correlations between separate, yeah, quantum correlations between separated systems in terms of information, in information sets, theoretic terms. So um, to get a sense of how that might go, let me just um, rehearse something that's going to be familiar to a lot of you. This is the um, basic setup of um, Bell tests. So imagine you've got a pair of systems prepared as some, you know, they could be photons, they could be, um, um, you know, um, ions, they could be sent to experiments, they're experimenters. As usual, they're Alice and Bob. So there's a Bob for you. And um, um, crucially, each one of these experiments has, experimenters have a choice of um, experiments they can do. So each of those boxes have, um, ha has a lever on it. Alice has A and A prime. Bob has B and B prime. The choice is supposed to be made at space like separation from each other and from the actual experiment. And simplest version of this, the, each experiment has two possible results, which you label plus and minus one. And what we do is we can compute the expectation value, the product of the two results. So if the two results are plus and minus one, their product is one if the results are the same. If they're either both plus one or both minus one, it's minus one if they're different. And any probabilistic theory will give you, um, for any settings and, and, and a given preparation, will give you um, the expectation value for that product. And if you do lots and lots of runs of the experiment, you expect the relative frequencies to um, closely approximate that expectation value. All right. And the key um, mathematical result is the Clauser Horn Shimonian Holt inequality, which I'm sure most of you have seen. And it can be derived basically from the condition that these correlations can be explained by local means. Like there's nothing mysterious in itself about, the, uh, about um, things at a distance being correlated. If you buy a copy of a book here in London, Ontario, and buy a copy of the same book in London, England, and then compare the results you find the same thing on each page, that's because they come from a common cause. They both you know, possibly came from the same printing press. So if you see, uh, basically the um, CHSH inequality is derived from the assumption that the correlations are of that sort. 
plus the assumption which was implicit originally in Bell's work and then um, made explicit after Shimoni, Clauser, and Horn um, pointed out that it was needed, that these measurement settings can be made statistically independent of the um, state of the source. A, um, a um, assumption that's been called no conspiracies or measurement independence in these days is usually called statistical independence by um, physicists. So that's, you know, not perhaps not the best terminology because it's a specific, specific sort of statistical independence. Okay. All right. And um, under those sorts of assumptions, the CHS inequality cannot be violated by systems obeying classical physics unless there's some kind of interaction between those with the wings. And um, interactions between the wings raise the specter of something that could be explo exploited to um, do uh, superluminal signaling, because after all, these are done at space-like separation. So if you had a classical theory that had non-local interactions in it, then that theory could um, produce violations of the CHSH inequality. But if it doesn't, then under the usual sort of assumptions, the uh, measurement independence assumption, then it can't. But as we all know, quantum mechanics for um, ent uh, um, entangled states can, and appropriate choice of measurement, can indeed violate CHA square. Now, the interesting thing about this, like when, when people first started thinking about these, you know, people said, okay, okay, this is still some kind of action at a distance. And maybe if we're clever enough, we could work out a scheme to exploit these stronger than classical correlations to do superluminal signaling. And um, you can't. It's a theorem that you can't. And the theorem that you can't was um, proven um, as a result of a referee report by a paper that was submitted to a journal that, um, pr that, that presented a, um, fa a faulty scheme to um, try to do that, to actually use these uh, correlations for superluminal signaling. So that's kind of interesting. We've got these stronger than classical correlations, but you know, by classical means, you, you would have to uh, um, violate, if you were going to pr produce them, by classical means, you'd have to violate relativistic causality. But you know, they don't go so far as um, making superluminal sil signaling pro um, possible. Um, on the other hand, you, could get even, you can go even further. So you, there are even stronger no signaling correlations. So, um, Abner Shimoni had the thought, or actually, that, that's the next slide, sorry. Um, so, um, yeah, there, there's a limit to how um, strong a violation of the um, CHSH inequality um, can be for any quantum system. It's known as the Schurzen bound. You know, that's a maximum violation, two, uh, two times the square root of two. Okay. All right. And as an illustration of this, um, Popescu and Rorlick imagined boxes that, that could actually produce a maximum violation of the CHSH inequality. So the way those go is you've got, again, two sides of the experiment. You've got two possible settings on each side, two possible outcomes, and no matter what the settings are, probability of both results on both sides is one half. So you can't change the probability of a plus result on Alice's side by manipulating Bob's setting, so they're non-signaling. But they are correlated. If the settings are A and B, or A and B prime, or A prime and B, then the boxes always produce um, the same result, again, with probability one half for each one. So on any of those settings, there's probability one half that you, you'll get um, both two, plus one for both, probably one half that you'll get minus one for both. So, but if the um, setting is um, 
A prime on Alice's side and B prime on, on Bob's side, then um, they're guaranteed the opposite. And if you just plug that into the um, Cacasic in, um, inequality, you get a violation up to four. Okay, which is not possible with quantum mechanics. Can't get beyond the Thurston bound of um, of uh, 2.8, etc. with um, quantum mechanics. Okay, now um, Abner Shimoni, who's the S in CHSH, found this intriguing because quantum mechanics is different from classical mechanics in that a violation of um, the CHN SH inequality is possible without opening the possibility of superluminal signaling or superluminal cause effect relations. But it's also different from any theory that permits the existence of PR boxes or anything that violates the, the um, serial and bound. So if you want to characterize quant quantum mechanics, you want to say how it's different from classical mechanics, but you also want to say how it's different from theories that might permit the existence of PR boxes. So he conjectured, and this is a bit vague, um, that quantum mechanics could actually be the consequence of non-locality, meaning violation of the CHSH inequality, plus no signaling, plus something else simple and fundamental. I don't know what that is yet. Yes? Can't we read off of Bohm's theory, applied to these examples with several degrees of freedom, exactly how a deterministic system not that we may want that, right, but right. Uh, gets around the issue. Yeah, um, good. Um, thank you, Lee. Um, yeah, I was glossing over that. <laughs> so Bohm's theory, I, I was sort of gloss, uh, um, tr um, talking about superluminal causal, causal influences as if they automatically raise the possibility of superluminal signaling. And um, as Lee points out, that is an oversimplification. Yeah. Um, because what you have in the De Broglie Bohm pilot wave theory is you have action at a distance um, in the following sense that you can prepare a given um, initial state. So, if you, those of you who are not familiar, the De Broglie Bohm pilot wave theory um, has a wave function like ordinary quantum mechanics, a Bayes assurance equation. But in addition to that, there are particles with definite positions um, whose dynamics is governed by um, a guidance equation which um, relates the, um, the, quantum, the, the phase of the quantum state to the velocities of the particles. So if you analyze the, um, this um, Bell test setup in terms of the, of the de Broglie-Bohm theory, you'll find that you can prepare a, a given wave function and um, you don't have control over the particle positions, but for a given pair of initial particle um, positions, then um, the outcome at one side can in fact depend on the choice of, of the experiment on the other side. And that is as clear an example of factors in um, this as superlogical causation. And the Bohm theory, in fact, is not formulated in a relativistic space time, but, with, but the equations of motion explicitly have existing relations of simultaneity. OK, I was oversimplifying things. Um, Abner actually tended to make the, to, to, to um, gloss over that like, like that. So you know, the, um, Lee's point was actually pointed out to him by several people on several occasions. And he would acknowledge the correction and then proceed to ignore it next time we talk about it. Um, um, so, um, because, and the reason for that is, okay, that's, that has to, uh, the, impo the impossibility of, you, of, you, uh, of using um, um, the action at a distance that's there in the de Broglie-Bohm theory to use signaling has to do with the impossibility of, of precisely preparing um, the particle uh, position states and um, 
in Abner's mind, that just wasn't important for, the, you know, limitations on control wasn't important for matters of fundamental physical theory. So um, that's why when he talked about it, he tended to um, equate, uh, gloss over the distinction between um, acting the distance and possibility of signaling. So thank you for that correction. So when, when, when you um, leave something when you leave something out for uh, uh, um, interest of time, then sometimes someone catches you on it and asks you about it. All right. So, okay. So, um, I guess you could make the conjecture: um, non-locality plus no action at a distance plus something else in its symbol of fundamental. If you're talking in term in purely operational terms, there isn't a difference. Um, between no signaling and no action at distance. All right. Okay, so, you know, Shimoni's conjecture is basically not really a conjecture, but a conjecture um, schema because you have to fill in some, um, something, what that something else simple and fundamental is. And it raises the prospect of a research problem of filling that in and getting. Um, you know, finding something of an information theoretical flavor which would give you all and only the possible quantum um, correlations. So you sort of see you know, the, um, uh, um, the project. I'm not going to talk, talk any detail about um, work that has been done on that, but it's a project of trying to understand the differences between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics on the one hand and um, theories that permit violations of the serial flow bound on the other in information theoretical terms. And there's, since that time, there's a huge literature on that sort of thing. Um, another approach is um, related to stuff that um, Flavinia was talking about. So this basically traces back to stuff that um, Lucy and Hardy did um, in um, 2001 or something like, like that. Basically initiating a project of characterizing quantum mechanics in terms of general probabilistic theories. So Lucy didn't use that terminology. And, you know, basically taking the general structure of general probabilistic theories and writing down a list of principles that uniquely sing single, singles out um, the quantum theories. Okay. And um, so one, there is a vast literature on that. Um, I'm just going to single out one paper by Luis Masanes and Marcus Miller. Um, and here are the principles that they use. Um, in system, and I think it's interesting because um, every one of these things is, of course, true in quantum mechanics, but you can, you can think, okay, they're actually substantive principles. They don't have to be true for general physical theories. We could take them for granted, but they are actually something that's it, it, interesting that they're true of both classical and quantum mechanics, or, or some of these are true of both classical and quantum mechanics. Um, there's, there's one key one that's going to be true of quantum and not classical. So in systems that carry one bit of information and that um, carries one bit of information means that the maximum number of distinguishable states is two. Was that N or K? Flaminia? Is K, it, maximum number of distinguishable states, is that N or K? I forget. It's N, right? Oh, it's K. Okay. Yeah, so one bit of information is K is um, two, and the, the postulate is that the state of a system c can be characterized by a finite set of um, outcome probabilities. And that's true, of course, by of classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. But if you think about it, it's, it's a remarkable feature of quantum mechanics. Think of a qubit. A qubit um, has a continuum of possible states. In principle, you could imagine a theory that such that for you know, for a spin one for, for, for a, a um, spin one half particle, 
you had to independently specify probabilities for um, outcomes of experiment, spin experiments in any direction. And as a matter of fact, it's true of quantum mechanics. Is are, these are related and you only need to specify three. Right. So the first one says it's, it's, uh, that's a finite number. It doesn't have to be in general theories. State of a composite system is characterized by the statistics of measurements on the individual components. Um, think of a pa pair of entangled particles. Um, there are observables that don't reduce to observables on the, uh, on the individual um, par particles. So total spin, it can, something can be in an eigenstate of total spin without being in an eigenstate of spin for, for either of the individual particles. But interestingly enough, you can specify the state just by giving pro probabilities for outcomes of experiments on the individual part for the individual um, parts, including, of course, correlations. Right? And that's you know, an interesting and remarkable theory, a feature of quantum mechanics that doesn't have to be true of general theories. All systems that effectively carry the same amount of information have equivalent state spaces. Any two Hilbert spaces are isomorphic. Again, that is something that wouldn't have to be true of theories in general. And here's the one that distinguishes quantum mechanics from classical mechanics. Any pure state of the system can be reversibly transformed into another. So if you think of a two state, a classical bit, you know, two states, zero and one, any states that are in some sense between them would have to be a mixture of the two. And you don't go from a pure state to a mixture reversibly. Whereas, if I take um, any two pure states of the qubit, there's a, pa there, there's a continuous path through the pure state. Okay. All right. Um, and, and then the last one is a sort of completeness um, of, of, of possible measurements. And in systems that carry one bit of information, all mathematically well-defined measurements are allowed by the theory. So you write these down and you know um, do some math, and you can show that any theory that satisfies, um, you know, those are all satisfied by quantum mechanics, and you can show that any theory um, that satisfies those has a um, Hilbert space representation with um, non-commuting observables. So the um, number four is the one that, you, that requires you to have non-commuting observables. So this project, I, I think, is an interesting project of um, trying to characterize um, quantum, quantum theories in terms of simple principles, either with an information theoretic um, flavor or something different, has um, engendered a vast literature. I'm not going to try to survey it, but a um, book that came out a couple years ago is a um, good introduction to that sort of thing. Okay. Some people have drawn even deeper implications from um, quantum information theory. Some people have suggested that we shouldn't take quantum mechanics to be a physical theory of the usual sort at, at all, but a theory about information. So here's Boob again in an article entitled Quantum Mechanics is About Quantum Information. I argued that quantum mechanics is fundamentally a theory about the representation and manipulation of information, not a theory about the mechanics of non-classical waves or particles. The notion of quantum information is to be understood as a new physical primitive. Just as following Einstein's the special theory of relativity, a field is no longer regarded as the physical manifestation of vibrations in mechanical medium, but recognized as a new physical entity in its own right. And some of you may be more familiar with um, Zeilinger making a um, similar suggestion at more or less the same time. So in the article called The Message of the Quantum, I suggest that the distinction between reality and our knowledge of reality between reality and information cannot be made. Maybe this suggests that reality and information are two sides of the same coin, that they're in a deep sense indistinguishable. If that's true, then what can be said in a given situation must in some way define or at least put serious limitations on what can exist. Um, so um, 
I deliberately chose to make this a relatively short talk so I know it's at the end of the day. So that's basically my uh, introduction. I'm happy to hear questions and, uh, or comments on it. Some of you are going, um, well, hey, wait, this is supposed to be quantum information and space-time structure. He hasn't said anything about space-time structure. Are the implications of quantum interference theory for, for space-time structure? That one's for you guys. Uh, I had a question about the last slide. Um, yeah. What I wanted to, where does the PBR? Where do you store the PBR theorem? What's so that? A, the PBR theorem, the yeah. the quantum state as a state of reality yeah. the theorem, where this fits in with um, this slide or the last slide about information and the distinction yeah. between. So, um, so that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, short answer is that in 2005, they didn't know about the PBR theorem. But what would people say these days? Well. Um, with the PBR theorem, um, well, for those of you who don't um, know it, basically the PBR theorem says that, you know, imagine the situation where you've got, it's set in the framework of um, um, what Harrigan and Spessions call the ontological models framework. And the idea is it's, it's meant to be a very general framework for physical theories that you've got some kind of state space for your theories. It doesn't matter what it is. It's got some kind of set of possible specifications of a, of, of a, um, of, 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 of a um, theory. So for example, the, point of the, the state space of theories could be just vectors listing probabilities. Those could be the states according to the theory. That, that could be the ontic state space. The phrase ontic state space sometimes suggests that it's going to be you know, something that you can you know, kick or you know, um, um, get your fingers in, but the framework is completely general. Um, no, no restrictions on what, whatever on the object state space. And just the basic idea is that for it, with any preparation procedure, there's going to be a probability just associated with any preparation procedure, there's a probability distribution over the object states. And then given an object state, there'll be a certain probability of outcome of any experiment. Fairly minimal requirements for a physical theory. And um, so um, probability, if I, do, if I do a preparation and then an experiment, the probability the outcome of the experiment is going to be an average over the, pro, the, the possible ontic states. It can be um, the result of the um, preparation procedure averaged by the probabilities associated with, with those ontic states. OK. And it follows immediately from, from that. And we'll say that, okay, two preparations are ontically distinct if, if um, they're guaranteed to produce different ontic states. So there's no overlap in the possible ontic states. So for example, um, yeah. in a classical theory, if I flip a coin, if, uh, if I have a preparation procedure uh, um, that flips a coin with probability one half heads and one half tails, and if I have another preparation procedure that flips a coin with, with three quarters probability heads or something, those are not ontically distinct because they could both end up heads. So once the coin is landed, those probabilities sort of gone with the wind. They've blown away. All right. Um, so, uh, so we say two proper preparations are ontically distinct if the possible ontic states that they can um, produce are um, are, are um, are, 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 um, don't overlap. If the ontic state space is just a list of probabilities, then I for, uh, for outcomes of experiments, then it's trivially true that distinct prepar preparations are ontically distinct. So don't be, you know don't be misled by this uh, this um, this terminology. Um, so um, what the so it's true so. Dis distinguishable prepar so it follows immediately the distinguishable preparations are ontically distinct 
then the question is, well, what about non-orthogonal pure states? And um, with a side assumption, preparation independence popular, they prove that yes, if you if you get uh, um, if you're going to reproduce quantum probabilities for all preparations and experiments, then non-orthogonal um, pure states are also orthogonal states. So, if um, Anton Zeilinger or Jeff Boob were here, what, what, what could they say in light of that? I don't know what they would say. I do know what I should say. Um, yeah, associated with distinct pure, uh, um, uh, um, pure quantum states or distinct states of information. So, it, it, you know, they, uh, um, they could, and I think should, embrace the TBR theorem. Yes. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask kind of a philosophical question. Um, Good. Following up on uh, on one of your slides, characterizing what was characteristic of quantum theory as opposed to other theories. Mm -hmm. One of the bullet points was, uh, I think it was something along the lines of uh, states that carry the same information are identical states, something along those lines. Okay, so. Um, uh, three, right? All right. And you said something have equivalent, like. Have equivalent state spaces, and that means there's an isomorphism between them. Yeah, okay, so in suggesting that that isn't necessary of all physical theories, I take it you're at least limiting what Zeilinger is saying, saying that in this last slide that uh, the distinction between uh, what can be said about reality and reality cannot be made, maybe only in quantum mechanics, if you're suggesting something along those lines. But I'm sorry, could you just say that again? Right. Yeah, so I take it that you're, you would disagree with a full-throated universalization of that dictum from Seilinger. Uh, and I'm guessing, I guess I just wanted to invite you to um, give yeah, some so reasons why, why in what case of physics that distinction should be made versus not. Yeah. So, you know, you could imagine, um, I, I guess, I mean, I mean, if number three were simply automatically true of all physical theories, then they could just remove it and um, have four rather than five um, postulates. So you could imagine some physical theories in which this um, isn't true, that um, um, systems that effectively carry the same amount of information have equivalent state spaces. So I might have one possible realization of a bit and another possible realization of a bit, and there'd be, you know, um, more possible ontic states for this realization than, than, than that one, so it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. You can imagine a theory like that. Um, and a theory like that would not be a quantum theory. And the title of the quote of, of the article that um, the Zeiger quote come from, what came from was the message of the quantum. Right, so he's saying this is the, if we think the world is quantum mechanical, then this is what we should think. We should think that um, uh, um, there is a distinction between physical state and, and information. But um, since that's supposed to be the message of the quantum, I would guess he would say that that's not true of all conceivable physical theories. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so um, as I said, you could imagine um, so um, a theory in which you could have two systems that have two distinguishable states and only two, but they don't have equivalent state spaces. So like one of them has more structure than the other, so there's no map mapping onto them, right? You can imagine it. You can probably sit down and write down a theory like that. You can imagine it. Why is that not true of quantum mechanics? Because um, in quantum mechanics, if um, a system has two distinguishable states, its um, state space is a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And any two Hilbert spaces of the same dimension are isomorphic. So it's true of quantum mechanics, not necessarily true of every conceivable physical theory. Yeah. 
Hi. Oh, dueling microphone. Uh, thanks for a great talk. So something I'm interested in is kind of when we look at these quantum reconstruction programs, mm -hmm. of course, there's a lot of different options that are available. And it seems like the, the reason why quantum reconstruction programs were interesting to begin with is because it would seem to kind of alleviate some of the conceptual difficulties with getting on board with the sort of peculiar things about the world that we come to have to agree with when we adopt quantum mechanics, right? The, the Hardy paper was like quantum mechanics from five reasonable postulates. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry, could you hold the mic a little closer? Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Sure. Um, so I guess the, the question that I have is what would the success criteria look like for a good reconstruction of quantum mechanics? And at what point would we be able to say, okay, We've, we've covered the conceptual terrain sufficiently broadly that we, we now are happy with how we've reconstructed quantum mechanics. Okay. All right, so if you're asking me, which you are, and um, why I'm interested in these things, I would say, well, what's interesting is that, um, the interest in this is getting clear about how quantum mechanics differs from classical mechanics and um, but other non-quantum theories. And my attitude would be totally pluralistic. Some reconstructions might give in, uh, insight to some aspects of quantum mechanics, other reconstructions might give an insight to others in aspects. So you know, I'm happy to say let a thousand flowers bloom. Now, some of the rhetoric that you find um, associated with the program suggests that what they're trying to do is explain why the world is quantum mechanical. And I honestly don't know what that question means. Um, like, if you, if you want to understand why the world obe obeys some physical theory, one way to do it, as Nick was talking about, or, or, or it would be to derive its behavior from a deeper theory, but that's not what they're doing. You know, so like why, you know, but if someone presents you with the world's fundamental physics, if we could indeed be pre presented with the world's fundamental physics, and someone asks, well, why is the world, why are these the fundamental physical laws? I'm not sure I know what the question means. Um, so, um, you know, it's true that, you know, in our world, there are these um, um, Bell inequality violating correlations, but superluminal signaling is possible, is not possible. Does it have to be that way? I don't know. I don't, um, Lucien, um, in his original paper, um, said something which I think was partly tongue in cheek, but only partly. The idea he, he said was, well, to come up with a um, set of principles that are just so compelling that you could, uh, prior to there being empirical evidence of the breakdown of classical mechanics, you could present this to a 19th century physicist and they say, okay, yeah, that's gotta be right. I don't think that's possible. I don't think there's a, uh, um, any way to figure out what physical theory is true of the world except to go, to, uh, to go look. So, yeah, so some people I think would say, you know, if they're trying to explain why the world is quantum mechanical, there might be, that, that suggests that there is such a thing as the explanation. Um, on the other hand, if the idea is just to get clearer about the structure of quantum mechanics and how it differs from classical mechanics, and that's my interest in it, I think. Okay, this one's interesting and shed light, sheds light in, in certain ways, and this one's interesting and sheds light in other ways. It's like taking something and just looking at it from different angles. I, I have a comment on, on the notion of information that was mentioned in the two quotes by Bob and Seilinger, and also the one that one can associate with PBR. And I think they do not actually match, and that's why the PBR result probably is not relevant for the view by Boop and Seininger. The one by the PBR is, as you explain this, is related to some kind of information or ignorance about some different realization of a density matrix. And once you condition on this realization, 
the probabilities for future results, you get something which is in all language called hidden variables. Mm -hmm. And they were never interested in the ignorance about hidden variables or the real state of affair, but rather a more kind of operational view mm -hmm. about information about probabilities or about mm -hmm. which result will be realized mm -hmm. given the probabilities in the next experimental run. So that's, I think, I don't think that not knowing 2005 was relevant for, for, for this program. Yeah. So if you say that, the last, last sentence again, I just didn't understand it. Shall I repeat? What? The, I guess, could you just repeat that last sentence? I'm sorry. So no, no, no. The, the, yeah. the last sentence was that they were not aware of 2005 about the result, but nothing has changed in, in even being aware of this result in as far as I can understand in their understanding of quantum theory. The, right the PBR now. result, they, they wouldn't change their mind if they were aware of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's correct, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the PBR result has to do is you're constructing some kind of hypothetical state space and, and, uh, um, and associating a probability of overontic states. And I think both Boob and Zeilinger in those quotes are saying is no, no, we should say the lesson of the quantum is we should get away from that way of thinking. Yeah, yes. Thank you for that comment. Um, hi. hi. Um, thank you very much for the very nice lecture. Uh, so uh, I was wondering about something. So uh, w one of the features that makes uh, quantum theory very strange, as we say, or mysterious, is this non locality, right? Mm -hmm. Which is. Um, yeah. Uh, the Bell theorem. Mm -hmm. um, so the Bell theorem can be restated as a causal compatibility problem in the sense that uh, so there is no classical causal explanation that mm -hmm. can give rise right. to such correlations, mm -hmm. right? right? So concerning your very, very last uh, slide, which is about the space time, let's say, I, I have a general question whether, because we don't have so many protocols that more or less kind of explore more the the signaling scenarios, mm -hmm. right? Because the Bell theorem is like a very specific causal compatibility mm -hmm. problem. It only looks at space like separated. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah, I was wondering generally uh, if you know or you can comment on this. Like we, I, I feel like it would be very um, fruitful to look at more causal compatibility problems in, in more uh, less, uh, I mean, less trivial uh, scenarios than just the space like separated, let's say. Um, I don't um, know if you can comment on that generally. Yeah, so it'd be useful to um, look at more general causal connectivity problems than just these um, two space like separated things. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, and maybe some people um, in this room know more about efforts about work in that respect than I do. Uh, can, could I ask an, another question? Yes. Uh, what I would like to ask is about uh, the reconstruction. Yes. So as an outsider to quantum, quantum information coming from relativity, in relativity, when we reconstruct like um, uh, the Lorentz symmetry, we, mm -hmm. the starting point is really that the speed of light is mm -hmm. constant and the same for all observers. Mm -hmm. So when I would, uh, when I look at these reconstructions, I, I would always think that finiteness of h bar should play the same role as the finiteness of the speed of light in, in uh, reconstructions of, uh, of relativity. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't see how this is playing out, or maybe it does play out. And could you comment on that? Yeah, good. That's a very good question because you know some of this work was in fact inspired by the model of special relativity because you can um, you, uh, um, you can you can understand uh, you, um, relativity in terms of postulates, some of which sound information theory that like 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 no possibility of no superluminal signaling and stuff like that, and um, and then that goes away as you take the limit as c goes to infinity, where and you could get um, 
of something like, and the idea is you get something like classical mechanics in the limit h bar goes to, to, to zero. Yes, yeah, so here's, um, and I think you actually do, because um, in any of these reconstruct, what a lot of these reconstructions have, the, the, um, the one thing I find interesting about these reconstructions is if you think the, of the space of all possible physical theories, the theories that are classical or quantum seem to be an island in there. Like the, 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 they, the theories that are either classical or quantum share a lot, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics share a lot of features that they don't share with other conceivable theories. And so what um, the, um, a lot of these things do is they write down a, a bunch of things that are um, satisfied by both classical and quantum mechanics. And then there's just one that singles uh, out the, um, the, the um, makes the distinction. And in the Masonis and Mueller one, that is the um, um, existence of a um, continuous path between um, any two, through pure states between any two pure states. And that is, that, if you think about um, Hilbert space representations of things, that's only true if you've got operators that don't commute. So if all your operators commute, then basically they've got a common set of eigen, uh, eigenvalues and um, the states are just mixtures of those eigenstates and it's basically classical. Right? And so there's no, super, there's, no, there's no such thing as superpositions of, of two distinct pure states. So that is essentially, um, um, in, in that case, that's the uh, that, that's the one that distinct makes it non-classical, and well, think of your canonical commutation relations. You, you know, uh, um, the if you send h bar to zero, you send the commutators commutators to zero. Um, yes. I, I'd like to make a comment related to Patrick, the, 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 this issue raised by Patrick and then by Wolfgang, and just mentioning it now on the on why we're interested in reconstruction um, from postulates um, and uh, um, comment is this I I had a paper back in the 90s in which I, I tried a reconstruction of postulates which was incomplete and to some extent has been completed by um, Philip Hearn um, recently um, the 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 model was was special relativity, like Wolfgang was uh, was saying. But the point about the two postulates of special relativity is that they are apparently contradictory. That that's why they're interesting. Mm -hmm. So if you just read them and you don't know special relativity, they just are contradictory. So right. to make them together, you're you're forced to drop something. So that's why they are so compelling. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, they, they played this fantastic role because the, the Lorentz transformation was there before and was were hard to understand because it was T prime, nobody understood the T prime. So they make sense of the Lorentz transformation. They do so by pointing up to, to facts that seem to be contradictory, both true, mm -hmm. and they force us to show what is it that made it contradictory mm -hmm. in our intuition and so that we drop this thing in our intuition. Mm -hmm. So what I was trying to do in 96 was exactly that. And the two postulates I, I suggested, which are still in some reconstruction of quantum mechanics, is that one is that there's a maximum amount of information in, in a system, a maximum amount of relative information you can get at the system. And the second is that um, you can always find new information, new relevant information from a system. They're apparently contradictory. Mm -hmm. um, and they're contradictory if you think classically, namely if you think there is a state, a, an absolute state associated to this, uh, to this thing. So it seems to me, this is just a comment, it seems to me that if this can be completed and what Philip Hearn has added is precisely something about continuity, but continuity again is something sort of mathematical, not physical, I don't know. If, if this, what is it, what should be interesting in the postulate, but I haven't seen it uh, more fully realized, uh, is not all right, so if this is true, this is true, this is true, here the space itself, I'll join the creator, follow. What should be interesting is that if this is true, this is true, this is true, we are wrong when we use that notion. That's what 
I think should come out. Yes, <laughs> I agree that that is an, um, an interesting aspect of the way you approach the um, reconstruction um, thing and be nice if more people picked up that aspect of the program. This one? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, Wayne, you didn't talk about um, what quantum information might be or what information might be more sure. generally. Uh, and I thought people might be interested to know that philosophers have addressed that issue. Um, uh, Chris Timpson in particular in his work on quantum information. Um, uh, and just to give you a sample of what some philosophers have said, there, there are two papers in the same journal by one author. Uh, what, so can you speak up? Yeah, there or, are two or, or papers. Point, point the microphone at your mouth. It's, like, okay. it, it's selective, it, 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 right ahead. There we go. Yeah, when people do that, I can't hear what they're saying, but apparently you can. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so there's one philosopher who's written two articles in the same journal. Right. The title of the first one is Quantum Information Does Not Exist. The title of the second one is Quantum Information Does Exist. Yeah. Um, I, so I think there has been quite an extensive discussion of what kind of thing information might be in the context of quantum yeah. information theory by philosophers. Um, uh, there's one philosopher who apparently doesn't even agree with himself. In, <laughs> in, in fact, that's not true if you read those papers. Right. Um, uh, and a, a lot of physicists at one stage at any rate got uh, tangled up asking questions like, how does the information get from A to B in quantum teleportation? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think some philosophers have said some very useful things in addressing or rather dismissing that question. Yeah. Good, um, thank you. Um, what Richard is, has just done is illustrated a remark um, earlier that is, I'm not, you know, that um, there's no way in the time of law that I could do justice to the range of philosophical issues. Yeah, and so um, that's one thing that for the interest of time I chose not to, um, to, to um, talk about, but it, it's um, a very interesting and important issue. It has to do with the meaning of the phrase quantum information theory. So one way you could parse it is, this is information theory, and there's a classical theory of information and a quantum theory of information. Right, so there, classical and quantum are modifying theory. Or you could take it as no, quantum information theory is the theory of quantum information. And there's, a, a, there's such a thing as quantum information that's different from classical information. And unsurprisingly, there's um, disagreement about whether it makes sense to talk about quantum information as something distinct from classical informa information, or is it, do we just, do we just have information theory um, which uses the same notion of information, but um, but the differences are the physical resources. If you do think that there is such a thing that of, as quantum information, how do you characterize it? And as you said, Chris Timpson has done work on that. Yeah, um, thank, I guess I thank you for that comment because that is an interesting body of literature that I did not mention. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had a quick comment about an example of a theory which uh, doesn't meet condition three. So you could just take quantum theory, but also add classical systems. So a joint general probabilistic theory with quantum and classical systems. And that would not meet condition three, right? Because you'd have bits, classical bits, and quantum qubits as two systems in a bit of this theory, which can't be transformed between reversibly. I'm sorry, could you just, I'm having trouble um, he hearing people's oh, okay. thoughts. Can, can you just, um, no say it maybe. again and perhaps a little more slowly. Sorry. Um, well, that's better. That's okay. the problem. Yeah. The ma masks and mics are not friends. So the question was raised about, um, you know, could we provide an example of a GPT which doesn't meet condition three about, um, you know, the amounts, if two systems carry the same amount of information, then their state spaces are isomorphic. And so one GPT you could construct is the GPT which has both quantum systems and classical systems add the systems in the GPT. And then, for instance, you'd have two different types of systems, qubits and bits, which carry the same amount of information, but aren't isomorphic state spaces. Okay. So it'd be like a concrete example of such a GPT. Perfect. That's the right answer to his question. Pretend I said that. 
Okay. Uh, unless there is a very urgent comment or question, I think it's time to thank uh, uh, Wayne for his lecture and all his answers. <laughs> And thank you for everybody who has, uh, thank you to all of you, especially those who asked questions. And I invite those who haven't asked questions so far to be ready in the next days. Uh, uh, we want to hear from all of you. Um, in, uh, um, um, at six, uh, we started the receptions uh, at the wave here in front of us. I just remind you that uh, if you wanted to join uh, the dinners uh, downtown, uh, sign uh, on the forms that are the, the reception. And so see you.